remember at the beginning I told you I was highly flawed? Okay, I'm addressing that right now because I just assumed that most of you knew who I was. And so I never took any time to explain it. And, and this finding a lady in the front said, excuse me, uh, but you are from around here. You seem to know a lot, and I don't know who you are. So I figured I'd better introduce myself before we start the second round. My name is Chad Booth. Uh, I have for uh, 30 years produced television programming in the state of Utah. Um, most of it has been on recreation. 10 years of boating, 20 years of um, at your leisure. When you leave tonight, you will see a side-by-side -side on a trailer out in front of the high school. That's because we are going to do a teacher story tomorrow on the South Cricket Mountain Loop. So um, I also, uh, for 11 years, uh, ending last September, ran a program called the County Seat, which dealt with county government issues across the state. That's how I've become so deeply immersed in understanding uh, that most of these people that uh, run for re-election need serious counsel because it is extremely <laughs> our job. I don't care if you're the sheriff, the assessor, the treasurer, uh, the recorder, the clerk, or a commissioner. <laughs> County government is nobody knows about, and it is it is the most important level of government. And I am convinced of that. I've been dedicated to that for a long time. I don't want to waste the candidate's time. So there you go. There's my answer. I stand corrected. Uh, I'm still not any better at flipping coins. Um, Trevor, I don't know what you call. This is for who's going first. Is the answer Go ahead. All right. Hey, I caught it. <laughs> Which means he goes first. <clears throat> I haven't lost your penny, Matt. Okay. My and I don't get along. How are we doing on both of the boy? Okay. Okay. So the first question that I would like to uh, Wait, have to uh, Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I told you I was flawed. Um, so, Dean, uh, here's your five minutes to introduce people to who you are. I am Dean Draper. I grew up in Delta. A lot of people forget that. I went to elementary school here. I went to junior high school here. My father farmed 200 acres in Abraham and 50 acres in Hinckley. Moved away in my ninth grade year. Spent 35 years away. Went to college. Got a degree. I did graduate from high school first. I worked in the corporate world for 25 years. I worked with J.C. Penney. I worked with an outfit called Elko Industries. I worked with a major multinational corporation for a while. And then my company underwent a hostile takeover. Now, I had been told two years prior to my moving back to Miller County that I would know when it was time to go home. And home is where I came. I came back to where I grew up. You folks are all my family. I love this place. I've spent my life getting to know just about every square inch of it, the whole county from east to west. I was involved in the water wars in the Snake Valley for 14 years. I protected everyone's water the best I could as a reporter or as a commissioner. For 10 years, I was in most of you folks' front room on the pages of the Chronicle Progress. I was your unseen visitor. I did not change in the past seven years. However, what I'm able to do did change. I'm not near as outspoken because there are legal ramifications on some things, and if I mention them, I can get sued, the county can get sued, one of the things I never did as a reporter for the paper was report on something I did not know. I didn't put out half information on anything. Half information 
is a half truth and it's as good as a lie. That cannot be tolerated in government, can't be tolerated in the newspaper, because you folks depend on learning the things you need to know out of that. As a commissioner, I have a fiduciary duty to the county called Millard, in which I am to protect its assets, keep it out of legal trouble, and a host of things related by following policies and procedures. The things that have been brought up prior to, I have always followed policy and procedure with one small exception. And that was approving the sale of a piece of equipment that came back and we had to say no, we had to take care of that differently. People are trying to put campaign on the road barn. I don't know why anybody begrudges the road maintenance people having a safe environment to work in in a marvelous building that would cost five to six times as much to build now that was necessary. How many of you milk cows? I do. How many milked them out there at 20 below? Not fun. Well, it's no fun repairing a snow plow at 20 below when you can't move it into where it can be taken care of. That was a good investment for Millard County. The work with Senate Bill 2002 came about because there was a visit to one of the senators, our senator, Senator Owens, from people saying that we want to correct the rural myths and legends associated with what's happening with the power plant in Millard County. That sparked a call to the county commission to find out what our side of the quote rural myths and legends were. That resulted in state code being looked at that governs that area. A special session of the legislature being called to correct things that were not good for the state. And subsequent legislation that came about to correct other problems giving the state oversight and accountability for one of its major assets, which is the power plant. I will not deny the power plant being an absolute asset in this county. I'm glad that you all came. I hope you get the shared information properly. Uh, my name is Sheriff Johnson. Uh, I also grew up here. I grew up out in Sutherland. I um, spent most of my life here, except for about five years I lived in Wyoming, uh, working up in a uranium mine. Um, but I grew up farming with my dad and my brothers. Um, and I love this area more than most. Um, it's just a great place to live. I, uh, one thing I want to comment on first is, is Chad said how busy it is. And you mentioned three trainings that I can look forward to go to because nobody loves going to trainings more than I do. Even if it's three weeks out of my year that I get to spend, I have time for that. And I'm stoked to go to a training and learn. Um, and I definitely have the time to do that. Um, so I've got the road barn and I know it's a hot topic. Um, and obviously we're both gonna disagree because um, we have different sides of the story. Or he has a story and I've got what I've heard. And, and uh, yes, while it may have been needed, I don't believe we needed a brick building. Um, we could have sufficed with a metal one for right now. Um, the, our West Side County Road building has been there for a long, long time. Uh, for as long as I can remember, and I've lived here um, going on 37 years. So uh, to spend as much as we did, I, I think was a little bit of a mistake, especially where we're worried about our tax income right now. Um, and we should have held off on it for a little longer. Um, and that's not saying they didn't need one. I agree, they needed one. I've seen their old one. Like, they, they needed one. Um, but we don't have the money to expend uh, like that. Uh, the other thing is a surprise bill that was passed in November 2002. While I agree with the bill, it was an excellent bill. Um, for the county, it was good. But the way that it was done, I believe, was maybe unprofessional, um, non-transparent to the citizens of Miller County, um, and not fair to a local business. Uh, I think our local businesses should be treated better. 
uh, and more upfront, and us as citizens should be aware of that. Uh, then House Bill 393, um, we talked about the water already on the Spear River. Um, I love agriculture, I love farming, and I believe that bill, while maybe not done on purpose, um, <coughs> but kind of like Vicki said, was, was done on misinformation or misknowledge of what our water rights with DMAD companies are. Um, so those are kind of the things that I, those are the reasons I decided to run. Now my platform, um, and you can put this in writing, is uh, unity. I know it's been mentioned that the, the commissioners meet with local, local city government, and I've spoken with local city government officials on both sides, and they have told me that it doesn't happen. Um, and we need that unity. If we're going forward, we've got to do this together. We've got to be united, not just as county officials and city officials, but citizens, businesses. We have to do this together. So that's my first one is unity. Um, my kids, I got one that's a year from high school, going to be graduating soon, and economic development. I want my kids to come back if they have the option, or if they want. I want them to have the option if they want to come back. That is very important to me. I love my kids. I know you guys love your kids. Not all of them are going to come back, but I want the ones that want to to come back. Um, protecting Ag. Uh, we talked about the water rights. Out of the three commissioners and the two of us running, I believe I have the best knowledge of our local water rights. And, and if I don't have the knowledge, I have good relationship with all the local farmers and those that use the water. Um, and will be a great benefit to the protection of our water as agriculture users. And then last and not least, my final one is fairness and transparency. I want to be honest in everything I do with you guys. I want to be open. I want to be considerate of your thoughts and your feelings and your aspirations on maybe where you think the county should go because it's not a one-man show. It's not a three-man show. It's our entire county working together as one to make the best decisions possible. Thank you. Well, I'll start to the question. <clears throat> I would like to uh, I, I would like to talk about the rescue services and volunteerism. And in, in more than just talking about the issues that happened on the Fillmore side of the county with the volunteer firemen and the search and rescue truck and all of that, it raises a larger issue. And the larger issue goes across the state and affects several rural counties. And that is that overall, volunteerism is on the decline. It's only natural. Most of us are families are no longer one-income families. They're two-income families. People are more uh, engaged uh, in trying to get their kids uh, safely to adulthood. And the kind of time that used to be able to uh, be available for volunteerism is slipping away. So the question that I would like to pose to both candidates is how do we address shrinking volunteerism uh, in a rural county where we rely on it so much? Uh, there have been a couple of bills that uh, come up, uh, mostly sponsored, I believe, through Carl Albrecht in the center part of the state, um, that have tried to address some of this uh, more on the EMS side. But volunteerism across the board, whether it's uh, whether it's rescue, fire department, or um, uh, you know emergency medical services, how would you, as a county leader? Uh, envision us addressing those issues uh, in the long term. How do we get How do we get past the impasse? Dean, I'll let you start, and uh, we'll do a couple this way, and then we'll reverse. Volunteerism is a matter of personal pride and personal worth. There are those who set service to others above themselves. There are those who have constraints with their income and their time or they're not able to volunteer. There are those who and end up having limited resources to work with. The 
legislature has committed through the tourism dollars, through the TRT that's collected, that money be set aside for use with EMS services. That equation changed this last year. This year, it's allowed to have 57% of it spent on EMS and 43% of it spent on tourism promotion. That is because between Nephi and Cedar City, an ambulance company cannot make a living on its own. Therefore, the counties end up rendering service. Over in Fillmore, they're faced with the problem of a freeway and an 80 mile an hour speed limit and 100 mile an hour drivers. <laughs> you have a dust storm down by Kenosh and you have one of the worst tragedies we've had in the county for a long time. The people who showed up to treat that, the EMTs and the firefighters who came from the fire departments to back that up, they get a minimal stipend for that. But you could get a job working as a tow truck driver right now and make two to three times what you can for being a volunteer fireman. And with little kids, that becomes a huge impact on the family. This is one of the toughest nuts we've had to crack. Over here on the Delta side, the Delta Fire Department attends most of the wrecks that happen. They're not accidents, they're wrecks. Some of them happen by accident. And they have it as a matter of pride that they're giving of themselves to those people and helping them. It's a wonderful morale building situation. There's a waiting list to join the Delta Fire Department. Volunteerism comes back down to self-worth where you give to the community. It's where people serve in elected positions and we give to the community. We're not here for our own aggrandizement. We're here to serve others, and so are these volunteers. It will continue to be a problem, but it is one that's been addressed where we'll be able to at least remunerate them for some of the time expended. I don't have an immediate answer other than appeal to service to fellow man. Well, I'm going to be honest with you. That's not the question I was expecting, and I haven't had it the whole time I've been running in the last two months, so I haven't thought much about it. Um, that's just being open and honest with you. But I, I believe everyone wants to serve. They do. But the days of going and helping your neighbor, like it was 20, 30 years ago, isn't the same. People want to go on vacation. People want to do things, and they need money to do that. Now, I don't know how we provide more money, but that's, that's the way you entice people. Um, and, and, I, and I love serving people. That's why I'm doing this. I don't need the money. I don't need the benefits. I want to serve our community. But when it comes to EMS, sheriffs, cops, those are the most important people in our community. Those are the ones that keep us safe. Those are the ones that when we get hurt. And we need to take care of them in any way that we can. Um, and so I, I, like I said, I haven't thought this topic out much, being honest with you. But those people are very important to me. And it is important that I take care of them. And how I do that, I'm not sure yet. But I can promise you that those people are very, very important to me. OK. Um, I would like to address, uh, I would like to address the municipal, uh, the municipal exemption uh, as, as the next question, uh, kind of shifting our focus over to IPA, which seems to be a big topic for the uh, for the audience here tonight. Um, the, uh, the IPA is an interesting thing because it's a nonprofit that was established primarily with the stakeholders being municipalities across the state. And so in part of, in, in part of building that up and finding customers, uh, there was supposed to be a discounted rate for the people who were actually in the community. Uh, but it was alluded to earlier in the previous discussion uh, that uh, we never fully utilized that percentage of power at that discount rate, but it continues to be a thing that's taken. Well, the, the problem that that creates is that while municipalities are 
members of the nonprofit, and you would think, well, you should protect the stockholders, but it's a nonprofit. Um, the customers seem to be the big beneficiaries. Most of them are out of the state, and that further reduces uh, the uh, that discount further reduces um, uh, the valuation, which then has an effect on property tax, which comes back to the people locally. I would like to I, I would I would like to get my head around this a little bit better and uh, give you gentlemen an opportunity to uh, address that. Uh, and um, uh, you know, obviously, legislature addressed it, but talk about the broader issue of of how we interact with a, a, a non-profit where um, they're dealing with mostly out-of-state customers and the, the few in-state, most of whom go other places to get their power. So to me, sending a resource out to be sold is basic economics, right? So if I have a good or a service, I want to sell it somewhere where I got money coming in. So if I sell it to California, great. I'm getting California money, we're bringing it into our community, and we're circulating it. I think it's great. Um, it's like farmers. We're sending stuff to California. Nobody seems to have a problem with that right now, but most of our goods and services for agriculture leave the state. Um, same thing with our power. We're trying to bring money in. It's basic economics. It's great for this area. Um, now, considering a nonprofit organization, they're a local business. I want to treat all businesses the same. I want to be fair. I want to be open with them. Um, I feel like if I can create a relationship with them, they'll do things that are going to benefit the county, and, and I can get do things that will benefit them. Um, so it doesn't matter if they're a nonprofit organization. If you can benefit the county, I want you here. Um, if you're a blessing to the county, if you provide this wonderful Main Street that we have, there's no Main Street in central Utah like the one we have, and it is because of a nonprofit organization. Without that, we would not have, Delta would not be Delta. Um, so a nonprofit organization, I'm going to treat just like any other business, especially if they've been good to us for 40 years. Um, it is very important to treat everybody the same, though. And that's why whether you're a nonprofit or you're a small business, you're a big business. I want to work with you, I want to deal with you, I want to work together to accomplish what we can as a community. Okay. <clears throat> 1973, the small municipalities in Utah and some of the co-ops had a need to have a bigger, greater source of power. The Interlocal Cooperation Act was passed in 1979, actually it was passed in 1965, it came into use in 79. This created the Intermountain Power Plant's parent, the Intermountain Power Agency, as a political subdivision of the state of Utah. As a political subdivision of the state of Utah, they were put on an equal basis with a town such as Delta or Hinkley or Fillmore or Holden. They were put on the same standing as Miller County. There are exemptions that they have from taxation. The state doesn't tax one of its own. That's how a political, rather how the municipal exemption originated. When they were brought to pass, they weren't big enough to create the power plant, so they put out feelers. And Los Angeles saw an opportunity and came, and they made an agreement with them, the six co-ops, and a few other entities that are in the state of Utah to generate power. It was first going to go down on the Kaparowitz Plateau. It had a chance in Emory County, and it finally ended up in Miller County. That was a blessing that came to Miller County. It lifted this county out of the first Great Depression. I was a kid here. There were a few people that didn't live with restricted incomes, but most people were struggling, and so it changed everyone's lives. It was a blessing therein. But the municipal exemption originally started out at around 11%. That was the percent of power that was to be consumed by the Utah entities. The other 
9% was going to be sold elsewhere through power sales contracts. The Los Angeles Basin counted on being able to buy them. They had what's called laying off. Meadow, for instance, is a member of UAMPS. UAMPS is the group that control this sale. They're the 23 Utah municipalities. They were the first point of purchase. They bought their 1,200 kilowatts of electricity, and then they had the opportunity to lay it off through the contracts and have it go down to Los Angeles. Because they were a political subdivision of the state of Utah, they were to receive an exemption on the taxes on that power. <clears throat> that municipal exemption is governed through the rules of the state, the administrative rules, it's commonly referred to as Rule 16. That has to do with the valuation of what the power plant is worth. They don't pay property taxes, they pay a fee in lieu of property taxes. It's at the same rate, it just has a different name. There was a special bill created in the legislature to allow that to happen. And the municipal exemption was included in that. If you want to read all of the laws that govern IPP, it's Title 11, Chapter 13 in State Code. The municipal exemption was extended not only to the 23 municipalities and the six co-ops, it ended up being applied to the power that went to the purchasers in California. There have been lots and lots of discussions, lots of different activities that have involved that particular item. In Senate Bill 20, run by Senator Bramble in the regular session, they addressed that situation that if the regular municipalities of Utah took their share, then they would receive that exemption, but that exemption would not carry on to the California purchasers. They figure that that exemption will be now about three, three and a half percent. That, when you're producing energy on a great scale, is millions of dollars. Again, the governor called a special session to look at all of these different things in November. The regular session took a look at it. Now, there's a lot of objection that's bringing up form over substance. I didn't like the way it was done. It was done in secret. It was hidden from us. If you can't attack the substance of what happened, you attack the form. Form doesn't matter. It was legal, it was called by the people we have elected to govern us, and it was passed. It was done properly, and it was the third of three special sessions that altered chap Title 11, Chapter 13. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> the next question that I would like to address uh, is still on the power plant. And, and uh, for those of us who don't live in the area, we are to some degree unaware that this transition that has so much activity going on out here is taking place to shift the power generation off of coal and onto natural gas and more recently hydrogen. Um, the, the production of hydrogen as a fuel uh, is very tempting and it has eluded us for many, many years. Uh, because uh, the only real simple way to get it is through fusion, and uh, we just haven't found anything that can control things at that temperature, and so then you just, you just blow things up. So uh, nobody wanting that. Um, uh, the hydrogen is, it is interesting in the fact that it is a combustible fuel that its byproduct is water. Um, IPA has an agreement, or the IPP has an agreement, for 46,000 plus acre feet of water per year that's consumable. It's not a ratio, it's not a, it's not a lending, it is, an, it is a consumption of it. Uh, it takes water to create hydrogen, and the plan in place, or the discussion in place, has been that 
we recapture the water and it comes back into the system locally and it's not taking that water out. Should you export the hydrogen as a fuel, the question becomes, how do you recapture it? So um, I, would, I would like to um, just have you guys address uh, that issue and, and how you look at um, monitoring and what the county can even do about uh, how our change in power consumption, fuels, and operation are going to affect some of the resources that are so important to the county. Uh, Which one you want? Uh, we'll let you start on this one and you can go back the other way. A. On hydrogen production, there are several different methods, but they have chosen in California to pursue green hydrogen. That means that you use electrolysis to separate the hydrogen from the oxygen in the molecule. There are published documents telling exactly what they intend to do at the Intermountain Power Plant as time goes on. The legislature was told during the regular session that they would cut their water usage to approximately half of what they're using in the cooling units. I'd like to put in a little aside here. When I was first elected, I spent three years with all the effort I could trying to preserve the coal units at IPP. It took me a while to find out that legislation in California had basically terminated their use in the year 2027. They will now shut the coal units down in 2025, which is why you have the conversion to hydrogen and natural gas. Natural gas does not conform to California law. Therefore, the blend with hydrogen, that makes it acceptable under their law, and they have 20 years to take it to 100% hydrogen. They are working on a conversion as they go. IPP has rights to 45,000 acre feet, not 46,000. I apologize. I was. It's that's okay. Just it's really close. I like it. <laughs> I told you I was flawed. Okay. 4,500 acre feet of that water comes from wells. They hold the rights to all 4,500 acre feet. The remainder comes from the Severe River, where they have their shares in the local water companies. They do not have the rights the water companies do. I'm really familiar with water law in the state of Utah. I've accumulated it over the last 20 years. They have a total consumptive right. That means they can use all of it, every last drop. However, in state law, Locally, it's known as a haircut because it's not going back into the aquifers as recharge. They have to have some set aside that's allowed to stay in the stream in the Severe River to take care of a, what would be a natural consequence elsewise. Dairies have total consumptive right. Some alfalfa farms have total consumptive right. IPP is not the only one that has this. They issued $800 million worth of bonds on the 3rd of May. They finished selling them nine days later. They published a 340-page document telling about the risks if you bought those bonds. And in it, under water supply, it states that they will use 7,000 acre feet of water when they make the conversion, and they will add 2,400 acre feet of water per year until they reach their 45,000. They intend to make hydrogen with that. There are two publications that you can look for. One is High Deal LA, H-Y, capital D-E-A-L, LA. That publishes all of the plans for hydrogen in the LA basin. There's another one called LA 100. It publishes everything they intend to do. The things that you see happening in the county with the current commission are based on our acquiring information through their printed documents and how to protect this county so that we go forward with structured development. Beginning approximately a year from now, you're going to have 
3,000 highly paid homeless people in this county. They're bringing that many construction workers in, not just for IPP, but for the associated groups, the people putting in the natural gas line, the people that are going to be building on other companies' production. You have Transwest Express that will put in a converter station on the Miller County Juab line. You'll see what is called new growth. New growth is tax money that's not already dedicated to one spending. It means the new idea of, hey, maybe we get a new gym, or maybe we get something else for county infrastructure because that money's not already allocated. <coughs> The conditional use permit was brought up earlier. They chose to modify the original one issued in 1981 instead of have a new one. Housing for these people was one of the problems in that. Law enforcement was one of the problems to be addressed in that. You cannot believe the reams of paper that I have read to be up to date on everything that's going on. And as far as turning that water into hydrogen by electrolysis and the pipelines that they printed, they want to send from Salt Lake, well, from Delta to Los Angeles and Delta to Seattle, they've got it all in print. I talked with commissioners from another county. They asked about storage in the Hatchtown Dam. 1994, the state engineer gave a ruling that if a cow so much as took a drink out of the Severe River, it would be violating the law. All the water for the Hatchtown Dam was sold to those water users that use the Paiute Reservoir. The evaporation would exceed the ability to store in Hatchtown or DMAD or even Paiute. We did talk to those people. We also told them we would not support it. And I took Andy Nickel and Jared Smith to meet Senator Owens to explain how water is used in this county. And House Bill 393 was turned over to a representative from Fox Elder County who knows nothing about how ours works. Uh, I'm going to correct both of you real quick. Um, the power plant does not have 45,000 acre feet. They potentially can, but this year was more like 20,000 acre feet of surface water. So when they go around floating 45,000 acre feet, that is potential. Um, they have rights to where they've had that much water in the past, um, but because we're in the drought, their shares are treated like ours. There's allocations made at the beginning of the year where each water company a lot of certain amount of water appropriated to each right, and that varies from year to year. It's not 45,000 acre feet. Um, also, it's for, more than 4,500 acre feet. It is. It is. Um, it's also, there's more than 4,500 acre feet of groundwater. It's actually 5,700 acre feet of groundwater. And one of the best things as of right now uh, for farmers is most of that surface water. Um, over the coming years, it's going to be allowed to be used by the farmers. I know Magnum for a couple of years has taken some um, to build their cabins. They've got a deal there. So not all of it will go to the farmers. But because of going to hydrogen, uh, the surface water is too dirty, has too much silt in it, um, things like that. So you have to, we can't use it in, in a process. We're going to use it to um, do cooling and turn the steam back to, to water. Um, so, the other thing I want to bring up is they keep mentioning this business corridor, the Synergy Corridor, and currently none of our commissioners have brought any of that in. This business that's coming in has not been brought in by our commissioners. IPA, if it wasn't for IPA, None of this would come in, and they've been sandbagging IPA for two or three months, years, saying how bad they are. If it wasn't for them, this new business would be coming in. And did you know that Miller County, according to the Utah Department of Workforce Services, is the only county in the state of Utah that had a decrease in employment last year? 
the only county. Sevier County had an increase, Pineland County had an increase. Everybody in central Utah, the entire state of Utah, we're the only ones with a decrease, and that is Department of Welfare Services. We've had commissioners been up to, should have been able to bring in business by now. Um, and that's what I promised to do, is bring business in. I'm not going to rely on IPA to bring everything in, because that's, what, that's what's currently happening, is IPA is bringing everything in, and our commissioners aren't promoting their own economic growth, and that's what I want to do. Thank you. Uh, while we're on the subject of energy, I would like to, and, and you can go first this time, and then we'll hand off to, uh, to Dean. Um, there's, a, there's a great deal of, of potential. If you look at the western corridor of the state of Utah, uh, we have solar energy development, we have wind energy development, we have, uh, <clears throat> we have a geothermal, uh, and now we're potentially looking at creating energy through hydrogen and we're shifting to natural gas. Uh, that's not to mention the, the caverns and the storage capacity that would be energy related. I would like to ask you what you see the potential for us to become truly an energy mecca through the proper kinds of development with these assets. I want you to start. I, I think the hydrogen is going to be phenomenal in all faucets. Um, cars are trying to go to it. Um, Batteries, maybe like it's. It, I think it's endless with hydrogen, and that that corridor or that that energy subdivision out there is going to be like it could be phenomenal for our area. I think solar is a huge thing. Um, we're in a great area for it. Um, the one problem we have right now is is we've had uh, people trying to put them in, but the companies they try to have come in and install them and bring them in and be the company to run them will not come in because our county commission is too hard to deal with. They've said, I will not work with your county, we will not come in here because of you're too hard to work with. Uh, and I don't think that's the way it should be. Um, I want to be a person that's willing to work with others and I want to make sure Miller County gets a fair deal. But you got to be fair with the businesses. you got to be fair with everybody. Um, it's not all take. It's not all, I want this, I want this, and I want that and we're not going to give you anything in return. There's got to be some give and take. And I have a personality where I can build a relationship and hopefully get what's best for both interests, uh, whether it's the business or for the county. Uh, the so-called supposed energy corridor is not an established energy corridor, but it is the whole county of Miller. We have an awful lot of open spaces and sunshine. The Southern Transmission System, which is the power line that goes from La Adelanto, California, since my opponent here is going to be so specific, up to the Intermountain Power Plant, has all kinds of applications along it by people who want to install solar farms, some who want to install wind farms. That's roughly along the Highway 257 Milford Highway. The Bureau of Land Management let us know about three applications that they have got. One for a wind farm, two for solar farms. Roughly anything that you can see that's flat on the either side of the Milford Highway will eventually have an application on it for a solar farm. Why? because the real driver of development out by IPP are the salt domes. The salt domes provide storage for different types of energy. They will provide energy to run the gas plants that the conversion from coal will make. But we have major companies from around the globe in power that are looking at joining in on this. You have Bewa, Hanwha, Energy de France, you have multiple globals that are looking at it. They just had a seminar a few months ago where it said the whole world is looking at Millard County. The whole world is looking at Millard County. That geologic feature out there is going to bring them. As far as solar farms and Millard County being hard to work with, we did our due diligence. 
a solar farm has generally a postulated existence of 20 years. On the tax structure, the county is in an advantage on collecting money for the first seven. There isn't a stream of income from it for the last 13. It's a wash. Our adjoining counties, Juab, Beaver, and Iron, gave tax breaks to bring in solar farms. They had a judgment levy in Beaver County because they gave too big a break to bring some in. Iron County was looking at the same thing, and Juab is now looking at the same thing. Solar is an absolutely great thing if it's done correctly. But why would you take a multi-trillion energy company, dollar energy company, and say, okay, we're going to cut your taxes in half and let you, the taxpayers of the county, finance it for them. We're here obligated to protect your interests and not give the tax burden to you. Miller County does not have deep, inexhaustible pockets of gold to dispense. We have a regular limited income, and no property taxes were expended on the road barn while we're at that. You try and spend money that the state gives you for the roads, and you will find yourself in real trouble. It came from the road funds. Back to the energy corridor. State lands has put what I call a crescent from IPP that goes down to the intersection where you choose to either go to Oak City or Fillmore. They intend to develop that. They'll lease it, they'll sell it. They intend to bring in all the related businesses. Our ability as commissioners to attract them is limited. However, our responsibility to try and keep that regulated so that it doesn't have negative impacts on everyone else in the county is monumental. And we put all due diligence and effort into it. And uncounted hours. Governing this county is not done on a whim. It's a multi-million dollar business. You don't make mistakes. You do, but you don't want to because they're costly. The energy will come. The people will come. It's going to be the future of this county and balancing agriculture with industry is going to be a real challenge because we want to protect agriculture. So we're running out of time. We're running out of the clock here. Uh, I do want to get to an audience question because so many of you participated. Are there any audience questions out there that have been written down? for either of these candidates? Anybody? No? No? Okay. I don't have one that's really great for both of us. And we, we're not going to give you, you have two minutes to answer. So Dan, this is a good one for Dan because I think he could explain it well. Then this is one that could have been asked for both candidates. This is, goes to Trevor. I hate to do this to Trevor, but um, this is something that was really to both candidates, and I just wanted to give them a chance to clear it up that one for Trevor. Okay, I've got two minutes each. All right, here we go. Lightning round. <laughs> I just wanted to say it. <laughs> <laughs> Who you got first? Dean. <laughs> Dean will take you first. Okay. Please explain the road barn and where the money came from. The issue that will not die. The issue that will not die. Money had been set aside to construct a road barn on the Fillmore side of the county to enable repairs and maintenance year round in years previous to 2019. In 2019, $410,000 was appropriated by the commission. That was basically to buy the metal skin. It was proposed by the road department supervisor that we go to cinder block, as it would be better in the long run for durability and other purposes. It was presented to the county commission as a whole, and it passed a vote of three to zero. 
to go with cinder block. There was an increased price on it. The monies came from the BNC road funds that the state supplies. Three more times, including an open public hearing for people to comment. It was brought up in open commission meeting. None of this was done behind any closed doors. And the next three times, it was approved three to nothing that we go forward. There was a stall in the process. It cost us because we stalled the process about several thousands of dollars on the trusses for the roof. The reason being is the price of materials went up in the meantime. There was no need for three bids. We put forth a plan in which we would do it in stages. The stages, if they were to be from outside vendors, there were requests for bids. We did a lot of the work ourselves within it, and especially the concrete. We saved the county half a million dollars in labor and in materials in the doing of it. It's a wonderful facility. The county should be proud to have it. And nothing, according to both the county attorney and the state auditor to whom this was referred because someone thought something was amiss, found anything wrong with what took place there. As Commissioner Warnick said, it was a miscalculation. It was not misconduct. Okay. The lightning round question for you, Trevor. And while I made a snippet about the issue that will not die, this is the cloud that just seems to hang out there, as far as I can tell. When it comes to voting on issues involving IPA, will you recuse yourself as a county commissioner? No, I, I will not. To be honest, I'm fair. If it's good for the county, I'm going to do it for the county. Um, we want to talk about the tax thing. Um, they have about eight years to resolve this and spend quite a bit of money doing it. If it's not resolved, by the time I'm done, I will be taking them to court in January. There's no, it's nonsense to keep dragging this out. Every commissioner for the last 30 years has been able to make it happen. Um, commissioners in the future can go make it happen. Why haven't we been able to do for the last eight years? Um, so yeah, I'm not afraid of IPA. I'm the lowest on the totem pole out there. In two years, I may not have a job out there. Um, there's a dang good chance um, that in two years, this could be my full-time job because of the direction the power plant's going. So no, I don't have any direct ties to IPA. Um, one of the last groups hired, one of the lowest in seniority in my specific group, I may not have a job in two years. So to do things for IPA is nonsense. I'm here for the county. I'm going to make the decisions that are best for the county. Thank you. Now I think we can get each of the minutes yep. to close. Thank you, gentlemen. These were our questions. And, um, we're going, to go back to the, we're going to go back to the magic coin here. Okay, now uh, let's see. Who, who called the first one? Okay. I called the first one. Okay, Dean, you're calling this one. This is for who goes first. Let's see if I can do this. Nails. Two in a row. <laughs> Holy cow. What did you call? Tails. It's heads. There you go. Okay. <clears throat> um, I'm grateful to be here this evening. Um, it's, it's a nerve-wracking experience, it's a humbling experience, um, but it's one I'm grateful for, and it's one I look forward to if I win. Um, I enjoy serving, I enjoy part of, part of being part of the community. Uh, those of you that know me, I'm very active and I'm very involved. It's not going to be hard for most of you to catch me. I, I do a lot of things with the kids, I do a lot of things with recreation. Um, I'm in agriculture, I, I work in industry. I'm going to be there and I want to be open. If you've got questions, you've got comments, you've got concerns, share them with me. I'm going to be open. And I want to be transparent with you back. If you have a question, I want to be able to answer it. Um, and I'm going to try my best to answer it. And, and, I, and I know to Dean's credit, there are some things that can't be, can't be said. 
Um, but I guess to be honest, this is the first time in two years that anyone's really been transparent about the road park. Um, we've all kind of been left in the dark. Um, and to me, that may have been my biggest issue. Um, when it first came out, nobody knew what was going on. For two months, it was in the newspaper, but nobody knew what was going on. Then it kind of faded, and I still think today it's been that same way. Everybody's upset about it because they don't know what's going on. And we did get some clarification from both Evelyn and Dean. Um, but transparency is important to me. Honesty is important to me. And, and I want to be that commissioner. Uh, getting back to my, my platform, Unity, I believe it is extremely important that we, have, we do this together. Uh, county government, city government, do get together, local business, uh, big business, small business. We've got to be in this together. Because um, it is, times are changing with the, with the power plant. Um, nobody knows quite what direction it could go in. Um, and then economic growth and development. Like I said, I love my kids. I love a lot of your kids and your grandkids. I've coached many of them. I want them to be successful. Um, it is extremely important to me that they have something to come back to if they want to. Whether it's in agriculture, whether it's just a good paying job with benefits that they can provide for a family with. That is extremely important to me. I have kids and that's what I want. Um, protecting ag. Um, I, I love agriculture. If I could do anything in the world, it'd be farming and ranching, especially the cows. Um, some of you will ask why cows, but for some reason it's just cows. Um, I, I really enjoy it. Um, most important with that, I want to, we have a neat culture here with agriculture, and I want to keep that too. Hard-working young men and women um, who get to the grind, uh, learn how to get things done, and I want to protect that because I believe it's important for our youth to learn that. Um, and then last and, and not least is the fairness and transparency. That's what I want to be. I want to be honest. Um, because those are extremely uh, important attributes I believe to have. And, and I hope starting June 7th when the ballots have been held that I can get your vote and stay sure of time. Hopefully I have done by June 28th. So, thank you. Thank you. This is our county. Each and every one of us wouldn't go anywhere else. That's why we're still here. Every action that I have taken since I was brought in seven years ago has been for your benefit and my benefit as well. It's our county. There has not been any seat of the pants decision. There has been studied effort, due diligence done so that we did the correct things, myself and the other two commissioners, whichever ones they were at the time. It was brought up that an agreement had been proposed and that Dean Draper said no and therefore it died. There are three commissioners, funny. One of them wanted it. What happened the other one? He said no also. The agreement that was put forward would have put a burden on this county and I cannot discuss it because I am held in a gag order, a non-disclosure agreement, so I can't share those details with you. And if either of the two opponents in this uh, race that are not incumbents are elected, they will be subject to those same non-disclosure agreements, which makes it really hard for us to be transparent on all things. The road barn was not done in secret. Now, the mutual opponent that one of the two of us sitting at this table will face in November has been to commission meeting to see what goes on. Haven't seen the other two. They have not come to see how things are going, what's on the docket. The interest level plus the lack of experience. I served on Hinckley Town Council as a councilman. I served on the Planning and Zoning Commission for six years. I went, as I said, to 80% of the county commission and other meetings for 10 years to become acquainted with what's going on. I have researched everything with IPA back to its beginning 
I've read every document that the county has in its possession so that we might be informed, the three of us, we share that information so that we can do what's right. We are not attacking our neighbors to the north. They have informed us that their workforce, I'm going to use the number 400 because it's just easy one to work with on mathematics. They expect half of it, 200 of them to go away through attrition, the attrition being retirement. That leaves 200. We have been told varying numbers of how many people be employed out there. Sometimes we're told 130, sometimes we're told 90, other times we're told 70, and in our research, sometimes it goes as low as 40. The people out there are genuinely nervous about their jobs, and that is not the county commission's doing. That is management of their organization and their decisions. The companies that will come that will be associated with this transfer to hydrogen will be seeking employees. They might not come all at the same time with help wanted signs on their doors. But the workers out there are all highly trained already. Highly trained workers are desirable when other companies come in and they will extend offers. It's not a dead end out there. It's the beginning of the future. And adjustments will be made, not necessarily by the Intermountain Power Plant. They will do their best to help their people. But the other folks coming in. There's a similar salt dome in Mont Bellevue, Texas. Global energy companies are located on it. They'll use it. This, this outfit here will be used the same way as it is. Their high school has a program for their juniors and seniors. When I visited it six years ago, a graduate in the program they offered in that high school matriculated and was employed at $80,000 a year without a college degree, just a high school degree because they had been trained. Those types of programs should be expected and hopefully they will come. I'm talking hope there. But the future is not black. Thank you. Let's give Matt back his penny because I know how hard he works for them. And I would just like to take a moment uh, to tell you how proud I am of you, the audience. I've been watching during this debate. I've only seen two of you on your phone and only one of you that nodded off. So, um, this is great. I ask you, I urge you, I implore you to take what you've learned today and your impressions. Ask any other questions you can uh, as the uh, candidates rally and or leave. And then tell your friends and neighbors about it. And, and try and help them understand the gravity of the issue and, and uh, what's taking place. And if any of you thought this was such dynamic entertainment that you absolutely want to buy another ticket, we'll be doing this tomorrow for a while. <laughs> and with that, I turn it back to Matt. Thank you very much.